Hello everyone and welcome to this webinar on Back Student Warriors. Um, so today's webinar, I'm going to do it in three different parts. So mainly we'll look at um, how you complete your setup in terms of your HIMSS admin, chest and integration and your ECAF integration, the different usernames and passwords that you require um, under the WiseNet portal. Then setting up your email templates to send your custom invoices and cans how to enable your vet student loan courses and also how to create your course offers with the units of study that you're offering. Once we complete the setup, then I'll take you into enrolling the learner, submitting the ECAF for that particular learner and managing the enrollments, of course, in bulk as well as individually, um, how you can edit the unit of study enrollments to change any unit of study fees, manage your credits and appeals and also finalize a learner by you know updating their completion statuses and unit of competency outcomes and lastly we'll probably go over some quick data integrity reports to um, check you know if you've put in all your vet student loan uh, fee help details as well as you know a bit of your exports and you know, other things that you have to complete every month now, before I go ahead, um, just a quick heads up, you know, if you guys are new to Vet Student Loan and you don't have that module, um, you know, linked to your LRM, please do contact us, log a ticket or give us a call on 1-300-365-384. So we can help you, we can show you a demo and also enable that module against your account because only when you enable that um, you know, new module, you will be able to see the vet student loan fields because it's another layer of reporting that's required on top of your Abbott miss. Right, I'm hoping everybody is used to the vet student loan terminologies because I will be using, um, you know, terms like units of study and ECAPS, you know, uh, which again stands for the Electronic Commonwealth Assistance Form, HEMS, which is your main help desk. HEPCAT, which is your reporting um, site, same like SVT or so your Debt Connect. So, and then of course your Chesson, which is your Commonwealth number that every vet student loan student is allocated before you do your first submission. If you have any questions at any point in time, I will be stopping um, at you know each of these steps. So you can ask me your questions and if you don't want to raise your hand and stop the session, just, you know, as I said, type in your questions and um, I'll get to it probably towards the end of the session. All right, I've just logged into a demo system. So you see too many uh, instances of LRM, um, but quickly, I'm going to take you into my account at the very top. Now, this is only available for a portal administrator. Before you start using the Fetch Student Loan module, it's better you complete this bit, whatever I'm showing you now. So firstly, outside of WiseNet, you need to apply for two different things. One is your institutional account with HIMSS admin. Now you apply for the access to HIMSS web service. It's called a web service environment form where you just have to complete your details and send in the application they will send back a username and password. You can reset the password at any point in time, but remember, every time you reset your password, you have to update WiseNet with those settings. So once you click on my account, click on show settings. The best thing to do instead of you scrolling down is to use Control F or Command F on your keyboard and type in Hems. so it'll pick up those different fields that you have to update automatically. As soon as you get your username and password, type it in here. So you click on edit, put in the username, click on the edit for the password and put in the password. Um, you need to set this up as false. So copy and paste exactly what this looks like under the HEMSYS test. And your provider code is nothing but your RTO number. Or if you've been given a different vet fee health provider number, just ensure that's what you put in here. All right, this is the first bit of integration that's required. Now, this is important for you to do your HEPCAV reporting as well as to allocate your CHESN. Once you've done this, the second thing that you do is apply for the ECAF integration. 
Now with the eCAF, there are two usernames and passwords that you will get. For the eCAF username and password, again, and I'm just gonna find the keyword eCAF, so it'll bring up those information for us. Now with the eCAF username and password, what you require is an API access. You will have your own admin username and password, but that's different to the username and password that's required in the portal page. So apply for the API access. It's called the API integration with the SMS form. Um, so if you go into the ECAP web, website, you will find the link, just apply for one and they'll send you the username and password. Um, by default, the username will have something like ECAP API and then a couple numbers after it. That's what it looks like. Um, so just ensure that the username has the API in it because that's what you require for your integration. The reason you require the eCAF username and password is to enable your two-way integration. So you don't have to actually manually enroll, uh, manually log into eCAF to submit your enrollment applications and stuff for your students. We've already integrated that with Wisenet. So as soon as you enroll someone in Wisenet, you wait for the two-day cooling off period and you can submit to eCAF automatically from Wisenet. And in the same way, in the future, once the student starts progressing into the course, you need to submit a progression form for every enrollment that continues more than four months within a course. So we have enabled that as well as part of the integration. So you don't have to manually do that through eCAF, but from WiseNet, you can quickly send out those progression forms. We will be talking in detail about these things when we go and you know, create a learner. But uh, these are the two main usernames and passwords that you require. So now I'm gonna go back into the profiles, take you into the LRM. Now let's talk about customizing your templates. So there are two sets of templates that you have to uh, customize. One is your email templates that are used to send out your invoices and cans. And the second will be customizing your invoice and can templates itself. So from this year, as you know, they've introduced another document called the Statement of Covered Fees. So we'll be talking about the Statement of Covered Fees as well. Click on Reports at the very top, and on the left, you have the U-Report templates. We've already defined all the fields for you, created the merge fields and everything within these templates. So as soon as you click on um, U-Report templates, you will find the CAN Automated, the VSL invoice notice and the statement of covered fees. Now, if you're on a premium med student loan version, you're gonna see the automated cans, which can be used as part of your overnight automation. If you're on a basic med student loan, then you, know, you can't use the automated cans. Instead, you will be using the contracts and you will just have to create even the invoice notice as part of the contracts template. When you have your face to one-on-one uh, -on -one session, could be face-to-face -face or online, uh, I would have explained to you the difference between these two things. But for now, I'm just gonna go with the automated can and the invoice notice. To customize these templates, it's very simple. You just have to click on the link. It'll download a Word doc, open it up. So this document is already predefined with all the different fields that are required, including the chess and numbers, the, so including the chess and numbers, the student number, the address, all the information that's required on a CAN. Now, all you have to do is check the information to students because you could have your own terms and conditions. So by default, the notice obviously you know, is sent 28 days after the census day, but if the student needs to correct any information, they have to contact you within 14 days. That's the default. But if you have your own policies and procedures in place, feel free to change it, you know. So we have just gone by what we've got from the government, but you can change it according to your own policies and procedures. In terms of picking up the um, census dates and unit of study information, the loan fee and everything, we have already put in the merge fields for you. So it's pretty straightforward. Uh, you can brand it, you can change the color, the font styles and everything. Uh, you can also put in your own logo, header and footer as required. You don't need to have the merge fields for your organization details. Instead, 
you can just type it in and hard code it because that's not going to change for every student. All right, same with the invoice. The invoice works very similarly and the statement of covered fees. Now the statement of covered fees is a document that is sent only once during the enrollment of that student. So the first welcome letter or like a confirmation of enrollment that you send out to the student can be attached to the same statement of covered fees. So you can combine those documents together and send it out. And that's the reason this is not part of the automation. Because with the CAN and the VET student loan, you have to send it out for every census day. So if the student is enrolled into four different units of study with four different census dates, so obviously they're gonna get four invoice notices and four CANs, right? So the statement of covered fees doesn't work like that. It's only once um, for, the, uh, for the entire enrollment. So you just have to you know, create that template. We'll talk more in detail when we actually go to the course up on how you can send the statement of covered fees. All right, now, once you've customized your templates, you've saved it onto your computer, all you have to do is come back into the U report templates, go to the action tab and upload the template. When you're uploading any kind of a template, always remember to upload it against the same template type. So if you have downloaded a contracts template, when you upload back the template, it has to be against the contracts type. If it's an automated can, then it's against an automated can, all right? Now, now that we have our templates ready, let's talk about the email templates. So the email templates sit under the settings. So go into settings, and on the left, we have email templates. Again, if you're on a premium edition, you can just add your own templates. You could have one for the invoice and one for the can, and you could also have one for your statement of covered fees. It's not going to be used part of the automation, but we can use it in your learn cycles, as I said, when we talk about the course offers. Um, but for now, let's concentrate on creating a template for your can and invoice. By default, we have created a sample email template for you. So if you're on your basic Vet Student Loan module, then you will have access to this template. All you have to do is edit and change the details accordingly. It's very similar to how you would edit any kind of an email template. There are placeholders. If you need extra information, place your cursor in there. Choose the placeholder as required. So as soon as you click on the placeholder, it'll just place it into the email template for you. And then you just have to hit save. With any of our generic templates, you wouldn't be able to change the template name or the description, but you can definitely change the subject. And this is what your students will see in their email inbox. And if you're creating a template from scratch, then all you have to do is just click on add new. You can give it your own name, your description, and change the subject and create your body however you require. And once you have your email templates ready, the next bit is to set up your overnight automation. So on the same tab, settings, you click on overnight automation, and you have to set up two different automations, one for your invoice and the other for your CAN. All right, to set up the automation, you click on add activity at the very top, and click on send can or a vet fee help invoice. So you give it a name, the name should tell you whether it's sending a can or it's sending an invoice, right? So let's say we're sending a can first. And as I said, by rule, you have to send it within 28 days after the census date. So we have to set the logic in here. So let's say our policy internally says, all right, you wanna send it probably 14 days after the unit of study in Roman census day. And if you are like, you know, having OSBIS relationship with a third party delivery organization and all that, you can filter by the delivery organization. Now, by default, you can either send it to every student who's eligible for vet student loan, irrespective of they accessing vet student loan or not, or you can take the decision to only send it out to students who have accessed vet student loan. Right? And then you choose the template that you've created as well as the message template. And it'll give you a heads up, all right, you know, the next generation um, date is the 25th of May and it'll be checking for any students having a census date of 11th of May. And go save, 
So this will automatically add to the automation. Then you would add another one for the invoice. And by rule, you need to send an invoice minimum of 14 days before the census date. So we could probably have the same option, but this time it's before the census date. And again, you want to send it only to people who have access to that student loan. You choose the appropriate template and the message. And now when it runs for an you know, basically tomorrow, it's going to check for anybody at the census date in the future. So anybody having a census date of 8th of June, 2018. And this runs every night. It's an overnight automation. So every night that logic is going to change. So when it runs tomorrow, it's going to look for 8th of June. The day after, it's going to look for the 9th of June. So if there are no students with that census date, it's just not going to run. It'll ignore that particular cycle. Um, I'm just going to delete the automation because we've already got two. It's just the demo system doesn't matter, but still. All right, so now we spoke about the templates, customizing the invoices and can notices and all that. Now this is gonna just stay in the system. It's not gonna trigger anything out because we have not yet created the course offers or enrolled students or done anything of that sort, you know? So let's quickly go into courses now. So as soon as you are approved for vet student loan, the first thing that you do is pick up the course so let's say, you know, you've been approved for um, the advanced diploma of business. So you pick up the course, go action, edit. The first thing that you do is at the very bottom, under the fee help eligibility field, mark it as vet student loan eligible. As soon as you mark it as vet student loan eligible, it'll give you the rest of the fields that are required for reporting. So choose the course type. So in this case, it's an advanced diploma. Choose the field of education. It's usually very similar to um, the qualification field of education. So it would be the business and management. So everything's in um, the drop down for you. So you can actually you know, look for it and choose the appropriate one. Put in the equivalent full-time study load. Now, the way you calculate this is if it's a 12 month course, then the equivalent full-time study load, I'm going to call it the EPSIL factor. So the EPSIL factor would be one. So that's how you calculate it. If it's a six months course, then it would be 0.5. If it's one and a half years, then it's going to be 1.5. All right. And if you need more information on how, you know, the equivalent full-time study load can be calculated for, you know, if you have a course that is only three months or like eight months or something of that sort, of course, you just have to divide it. But still, you know, if you need more information, please go into HEMS Help. Um, their resources are pretty good and you can learn more about how to calculate the equivalent full-time study mode. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep it easy. And let's say like it's a 12-month course, I'm going to just put it as one. And if you are, um, you know, taking enrollments this year, then it's reportable to HEPCAP. So we'll put the tick on and go save, all right? This is the first thing that you do as soon as you're approved for the course. Once you have saved this information, the next step is to create your offers. So I'm gonna quickly create an offer. Now, when you're creating an offer, very similar to you know, any other course offer, but the complication is you know, if you do have funded students accessing that student loan. Sometimes you know, the funding um, cap is lesser than your course enrollment fees. So the student may not be able to offer, you know, paying everything up front. So they may choose to take that student loan if they are eligible for it. So in that case, obviously the evidence details that you put against the course offer is going to change. Now for that student loan, it's mandatory for you to um, kind of report all the students who are eligible for that student loan. Irrespective of they're taking the loan, not taking the loan, doesn't matter. If they're eligible, then you have to report it to HEPCAP, right? Now, to make it easier and not complicate, you know, the initial course offer that I'm creating for you, I'm just going to take the students as fee for service, right? None of them are funded, but they're eligible for vet student loan. So I'm going to create an offer code. So let's say it's for 2018. 
Advanced Diploma of Business for Batch Student Loan. So as soon as you look at your offer, it needs to tell you what kind of a, what kind of an offer it is. So as soon as you look at it, you know it's Advanced Diploma of Business, Batch Student Loan offered in 2018. Right? Let's put the status as active. It's currently being taught. And the offering start could be the 1st of July. So let's say we're starting a new batch. And until the 31st of the 12th, 2018. Now, what the offering start and end is telling you is that, you know, any student who enrolls within this time period, within the next six months, is going to be put into the same course offer. If you have a student starting in 2019, then you will copy the course offer and create another one for 2019, all right? Now, I'm kind of, you know, creating a rolling intake in here just to show you how you manage rolling intakes for batch student loan. But most of you guys may have like specific intakes for batch student loan because you don't want to um, change the census dates because you have to publish the census dates on your website. That's a mandatory rule again. So you may have just, you know, specific intake dates and specific census dates. In that case, your offering start and end will be the exact start and end of your course. All right. But in this case, I'm just going to take it as a random rolling intake. Let's say I'm expecting around 100 students. A minimum of one. You can choose the coordinator, not mandatory, but you can put that in there. Course offer type, you can create your own customized drop downs by going into settings and drop down lists if required. The language taught is in English and it's a 12 month full time study course. All right, now scroll down. I'm going to skip the online enrollment bit. So, with the Evitmus defaults, now as I said, the Vet Student Loan is just another layer on top of your Evitmus reporting. Because it's a VET course, you have to do both your Evitmus reporting as well as your HEPCAP reporting. And if you're funded, obviously these students are reported every month to the state government as well as to HEPCAT for your VET student loan reporting. If you're fee for service, then you just have to stick to your NCVR rules and just, you know, send your students to NCVR once a year or every quarter, whatever suits you. Now, if we put the four Evitmus stick on, the program status and the contract type that's mandatory if you're funded, so we'll ignore that bit. The commencing course identifier will be a number three because they're commencing enrollment in the new qualification. The study reason may vary per student, so I prefer putting that information at the student level so you can leave that blank. Put in the study mode so it's full time. Choose the location. You don't have to do the AV7 anymore because it's Evitmus 8 from 2018. So I'm just going to put in the Evitmus 8. So let's say it's completely classroom based. So we go internal. The funding source national. Because it's a fee for service course offer, I'm just going to go with 20 domestic for fee paying client. And the funding source state. So according to the state that you're going to deliver in, you will be picking up the appropriate um, funding source state. Of course, the training schedules as well. And the fee exemption can be left blank if it's fee for service, but if you want to just put in a none, that'll work as well. So this is a basic thing that you have to complete for a fee for service course offer, right? Now, the unit training detail, up to you. If the trainer and assessor is going to be the same for all the units that you're delivering within the course, you can put that in, otherwise just leave it blank. Now, under the fees, there are a couple of things that you require for your ECAF integration. The first thing that you require is the course fees. So let's say the course fees for the advanced type of business is 12,000, but the loan cap is only 10 grand. So what the student can get as a loan from the government for this particular course could just be 10,000 what the government has allocated. But if you're charging 12,000, so the remaining 2,000 would be an upfront fees that you will be charging your students, all right? This is very crucial because when you actually send that uh, enrollment to ECAF, they will be sending out the application to the student to complete it. And all this information is gonna be contained in there. I'm sure you'll have all these fee structures published on your website, 
but still just to make it easier for your students. You know, the ECAF application also has the same information. So they know the 2000 is going to be an upfront payment that they have to make to you. All right. So the course fees and the ECAF is important. Scroll all the way down and click save. That's all you require. Now the next step is to create your unit offers. So click on unit offers, go action, add or edit unit selection. So in your case, it will be a lot easier because you would have enabled your core and elective for your courses. So you know exactly what to choose. In Just for the demo purposes, I'm gonna randomly choose um, 10 units in here and save it. So they automatically inherit the start and end date from the course offer. Now, if the trainer and assessor, you already know who's been allocated for what unit, you can set it as a default. So you can um, choose, pick and choose your units, go under the action and set defaults. And you can set defaults with the start and end dates, with any of this information. Could be like the assessment method, the trainer, SSR, all these different things. And once you've completed that, the next step is to create your units of study. That's what is crucial for your vet student loan. So let's say for the advanced diploma of business, you have split the units uh, into four different units of study. So you go action, add unit of study. The code and description has to be unique for every unit of study that you create per census state. All right, so we'll go code. I'm just going to make it easier and just call it you know, study one. And let's say the census day is 20% from the start day. So again, um, if you don't know how to calculate the census date, there is a census day calculator. So just go into Google and go census day calculator. So they'll pick up the education.gov.au site. And if you click into that link, it'll give you either a word format or an Excel format of the spreadsheet where you can just put in the start date, end date of the unit, and it'll automatically uh, come up with the census date for you. So all you have to do is you know, put that census date in here. So the formula, they've already put that in there. So it just calculate 20% from the start date of the unit of study. Now the organizational unit code. So there are many fields in the system that are uh, not mandatory for you to report for vet student loan, but you know if you do know the codes, you have to report them. You know, so when I come across such fields, what I usually recommend is go into the Hims Help website. So go to the Data Element Dictionary. So look for the 2018 Data Elements, and scroll down to find the Vet Data Collection. You can either search by file, by name or number. I usually go by name. And, you know, again, you know, control F or command F just to find that organizational unit code. Pick that up. So if you go into any element, it's going to have the coding notes. So we have predefined certain things for you in the export just to make it easier. But just for your knowledge to know how we find things, if you go under the coding notes, always look for VET only. So under the VET only, it'll tell you if it's required, not required. If it is required, then what's the code to be reported? So in this case, the organizational unit code is not applicable for VET student loan, but they say you need to report the code AOU. So any unit of, unit of study that you create in the system, it'll have the same code. You just have to report AOU, right? So under the organizational unit code, we got AOU. The field of education will be the same. You would know this better according to your courses. The equal and full-time study load. Now, if I've equally distributed the units amongst those four units of study, because my full-time study load for the course is one, I know that per unit of study is gonna be 0.25. So you just have to calculate it depending on the hours and what is the full-time study load the student's gonna incur per unit of study. All right, and let's say I'm charging a full fee of 3000 and the credit or RP fee is zero. And you pick and choose what are the different units that goes under this unit of study. 
and go save. Now let's say that because it's a rolling intake, I know the first intake is the 1st of July and the census date for the year of 31 is a 17-8. Now you can enroll all the students into the same unit of study and change the census date against the student. That's possible. Or another way is for you to copy this unit of study and create the same for a different census date. And when you enroll your students, you can pick and choose which census date you want to put the student into. All right. When you're doing this, I always recommend you to have a unique code Otherwise, you know, it's really hard for you to know which census date you're putting the student into. So if this is a November intake, I would just go November US 1. So it's just unique for that particular year of study then. Or I'm just going to leave it as one and I can show you how you change the census date when you actually go into the student. We can add another unit of study for the unit of study 2. We can choose the units accordingly. And then if you are having you know especially like with courses like aged care children's services and early childhood education you may have units that are like let's say 200 hours you know and they may get split between two different units of study if that's the case remember to come into the profiles under my account go into settings and there's something called advanced unit grouping you need to enable the advanced unit grouping setting so put this on so what this does is it allows you to uh, offer that unit of competency against multiple units of study. So it'll allow you to choose the same units that you chose in the last unit of study, even in the second unit of study. Basically, that's what it does. And then you save. So once you've created all the different units of study, it'll all stay in here, ready for you to enroll your students. Right. All right, so now before we start enrolling, the first thing you need to do is create a new profile for your learner. I'm just going to take an existing learner. So once you have the learner profile, all you have to do is action and click enroll. Usually with Vet Student Loan, you're only going to enroll one by one because there are too many things that can change against the student and all that. You can do uh, bulk enrollments, it's up to you, but uh, still you'll have to come into uh, every student and change the details accordingly. Now, there's one thing that I forgot to show you. Let me just go back a step. Now, against the profile of the student, if you go into the demographic information, at the very bottom, you're going to see some fee help data. Now, all these fields are not mandatory. The only mandatory field for at Vet Student Loan is the Indigenous status, the citizen resident, and the year arrived in Australia. So these are the three main fields that are required and you have to complete this before you can enroll the student into the course because that's crucial information for the ECAF. The ECAF can only be sent to students who are eligible for Vet Student Loan and for them to have eligibility, they have to be like, you know, either an Australian citizen or a New Zealand citizen or a humanitarian visa. So choose accordingly. In this case, I'm going to put it as an Australian citizen. I'll explain why when we go into the enrollment and because it's an, I'm just going to leave that blank. Now, when you leave the year arrived in Australia blank, we automatically report whatever is required for a person born in Australia. Uh, if the student has actually arrived in Australia and then become a citizen, then you have to put in the year arrived in Australia. Otherwise, if the country of birth is Australia, then we automatically report the default value for you. All right, now let's go and enroll. Let's go enroll learners. So I'm going to just quickly go through this. So we'll put the student as current, study mode is full time, start and end day. That's automatically picked up from the course offer but because it's a rolling intake if the date is any different you have to change the dates accordingly then you have an enrollment date now the enrollment date is used for ECAF purposes because you can't send the student to ECAF like until two days after the enrollment date the enrollment date is the day the student first enrolled into your organization all right so let's say even though the course is starting on the 1st of july it doesn't matter today is the 24th of may so i'm just going to go 24 
of May. So once we put that date in, you need to wait for two business days. And when I say two business days, if he's enrolling today, we need to wait for Friday, Monday. So you can send the ECAF information only on Tuesday, right? And they're very strict about it. And our system also validates this. If you try sending the ECAF tomorrow, it's going to give you an error saying that you have not waited for the two cooling off period days. It's going to give you a warning. So just to ensure that, you know, you always wait for those two days. Now, after this, I'll be talking about some learn cycles and automation where you can allow the system to task you. So you don't have to remember to send this out manually. Um, and yeah, I'll explain more about how you can put this as a task in the learn cycles, all right? So for now, the enrollment date is the day the student first enrolled um, into your organization. So within this course, basically, I've taken that as a new learner. And then you put in the study reason because we left that at the course offer level. Scroll down, complete the vet student loan bit. Now, under the compliance, there's a field called Access Vet Student Loan or Vet Fee Help. I'm going to leave that blank. The only reason being we don't know if the student is going to be approved for Vet Student Loan and you will know that only after uh, the student has submitted the ECAF application and it's been processed. So for now, all we need to do is tick the eligibility on the estimated yearly Fs is one, student is a commencing student, put in a fee type indicator, the admission basis. For all your VET courses, it's going to be 34. The attendance type, whether it's full-time or part-time. And the study reason, unfortunately, these two codes are different. So you have to choose them twice for evidence as well as ECAF purposes, all right? So once you put in the VET student loan information, now, at this point in time, you can basically save and finish. You don't have to put the student into um, the unit of study unless they've come back as an approved. But let's say the student is eligible but not taking wet student loan, then it's a different scenario. You have to enroll them into the unit of study. So I'm going to go ahead and save and choose unit enrollments. Put the student into that unit of study, confirm, and save and finish. So now, we have completed the enrollment process. Now that I've completed the enrollment, you know, all I have to do is manage the enrollment. But if you're on a premium edition, obviously you have learn cycles and things that you can use to uh, manage these enrollments and, you know, automate certain things for you. So when you click on learn cycle against the course of file, the main two things that you really require is, of course, reminding you about that ECAF and then sending out your confirmation of enrollment and statement of covered fees. So there are a couple of ways of doing it. You know, So let's say when you take the enrollment in, um, you may choose to put the status as pending. So I'm just going to quickly change the status to a pending to give you an option of what you can do with the learn cycles. So let's say, you know, you enroll the student with the status of pending. Against the learn cycle, you can tell the system, action, add learn cycle activity. As soon as the enrollment is created, you want to create a task. And the task could be called send ECAF. Priority is high because you don't want to miss that task. By default, it's going to be not started. But you don't want to immediately trigger the task. You want to trigger the task two days after the course enrollment start date. So let's say like, you know, for example, you've put in the start date of today. So now you may ask the question, you know, because it needs to trigger from the enrollment date. That's the kind of the ECAP census date that you have for the student. So you have to send it two days after the enrollment date. At the moment, we don't have the enrollment date as part of uh, the learn cycles. As you can see, it's something that we are building and it's not released yet. So for the moment, what we usually do is, you know, if you don't have the start date as the same as the enrollment date, we kind of um, ask you to use the trigger conditions for each, which means it's going to put in the task for you two days after the enrollment is created, all right? And you want to assign it to the staff member who's responsible to send that ECAF out. And you can put in more information as required and go save. So that's going to sit within the learn cycle. 
The next activity that you want to do is not when the core syndrome is created, but when the status changes to current, you want to send a message out to the student with the message template. It could be confirmation of enrollment, a statement of covered fees. You could have your own email templates. It's created exactly the way I showed you for the Canon invoice. You want to send it to each and every learner and custom schedule it. Again, if required, otherwise, as soon as you change it to the current, you can send it out. Now, this is what you can do if you're on, like, you know, if you if you don't want to create like a Europe or template or anything for your statement of covered fees and you have all that information in an email. But if you want to send out the statement of covered fees as a Europe or document, then you need to choose the third option. So instead of you sending out a message, you can go generate a Europe or so the template type is going to be contracts. You choose the statement of covered fees, and then you choose the message template called confirmation of enrollment. When you do this, what happens is it generates the statement of covered fees, as well as sends an email out to the student with the confirmation of enrollment. So the confirmation of enrollment is just going to be the body of the email, and the statement of covered fees is going to be an attachment within that email. All right, so let's say you want to send it to every learner immediately when the trigger condition is reached. If you have any course information guides and things that you want to send to them, you can even add that on and go save. So these two learn cycles are kind of mandatory, but as I said, you know, for you to complete the statement of covered fees when the status changes to current, you definitely need to be on a premium edition. Tasking yourself to send the ECAF when the course enrollment is created, you can definitely do that, even on a standard edition. And probably you could have another task to say, you know, by the start date or a week before the start date, just to check if you can send the um, statement of covered fee. So you can custom schedule that if required, if you're on a standard edition. Once you have this in place within the course offer, as soon as you enroll the client, this will be triggered. Now, sending the ECAF out, to send the ECAF out, you need to go into the course environment for that student, click edit, scroll down. Now, as I said, you have to ensure the cooling off period has been completed before you send the data to ECAF. When you click on send to ECAF, it'll automatically send out the application to ECAF. Now, the automated process is only available if the student is an Australian citizen. If the student is on a humanitarian visa or, in, or is a New Zealand citizen, then at the moment you still have to manually submit your data to ECAF. So you have to go into the ECAF and then submit the ECAF manually for those students. And obviously you're gonna get the ECAF ID, the status and everything. So you just have to put that information in here and then save. If it's an Australian citizen, you don't have to do any of this. It'll automatically send the application to ECAF for you. All right, so that's with the ECAF. Now the last bit is about changing the unit of study fields when there's a credit or an RPO or when the student is uh, completing their course. So if you go into unit enrollments, click into unit of study enrollments. So let's say the student has applied for a credit transfer or an RPO. Now, for the credit transfer, there's no specific process you know, that's published anywhere for vet student loans. You know? For RPO, definitely there are certain things that you have to remember. But for credit, you could be offering a credit on just a couple of units within a unit of study. So it, it's best when you kind of you know, just discount the amount. So let's say, for example, in this case, I'm taking the student to have access to vet student loan in this case. So the student hasn't paid anything up front. So there's a help debt incurred. But let's say you have a, um, the student has been given like a thousand dollar discount and he's applied for um, a credit transfer against one of the units. So what you do is under the other payments, you change that to a thousand. So that's a discounted amount. And in the payment notes, just put in discount one unit credit transfer. So you know exactly why you've discounted that thousand dollars. So then what the system does is it auto calculates the loan amount to be 2000. So it's discounted thousand of the total 3000 the unit of study fee. 
apply the 20% discount and calculated the health debt for you. So this is when you have given a credit transfer. When it is an RPO, it's a little different because for the RPO, you know, it depends whether the unit of study is completely RPO or if it is, you know, if just a component of it is RPO. So in that case, you need to choose the rest of the fields accordingly. So let's say the credit or RPO status is 200. So you've offered the RPO for the prior batch study. You've accepted the RPO and it consists wholly of RPO. You put in rest of the details in here. The completion status is going to be a number five, which is RPO. Now, because I have, um, you know, put in like a fee of zero dollars for the RPO against the unit of study, it's going to show me zero in there. And obviously this is not in here. And by default, everything just becomes zero. So you apply these fields only when the entire unit of study is RPO. Right. If only a couple of units have been given as an RPO, then ensure that you know you don't change any of these. Uh, we are going to publish a new article on how to manage your credit transfers in RPO in our resource very soon. So you will get more information and some links out to HEPCAT on how you can manage your um, RPO process. Now, let me go back without saving anything. Now, let's say the student has completed the unit of study and has been deemed competent in all unit of competencies that are linked to the unit of study. In that case, remember to change the completion status from a four to a three, which is successfully completed all the requirements. If the student has withdrawn, now there are two types of withdrawals when it comes to VET student loan. The student can withdraw before the census date or after the census date. So if the student withdraws before the census date, then you have to put in a number nine. All the number nines are created by WiseNet and they are non-reportable outcomes. So if you choose a nine, that particular uh, enrollment is not gonna be reported to HEPCAP. So if they withdrew prior to the census date, they don't incur any debt, so everything just goes zero and it's not gonna be reported. However, if they withdraw after the census date, then you have to choose number one, which is withdrew without penalty. Penalty in this case means they don't incur like an academic penalty, but they do incur a financial penalty. So obviously it's going to be 401. So this is the way it'll look like. So the student has you know, applied for that student loan, has accepted it, but is withdrawing after the census date. So what happens is you put it to a one, so they still incur the same debt. You get your 3,000 from the government and they have to pay back 3,600 because they withdrew after the census date, all right? So again, to explain the penalty here, it's they don't get an academic penalty, they don't get a fail or an N by C, but they do incur a financial debt. The last bit of it is of course your um, Veteran Loan Progression. So if you go into Reports and ECAF for Progressions there. Now, we don't have a proper you know, ECAF login and password, so I, I really can't demonstrate the entire process end to end, but you will, once you put in your own username and password, you wouldn't see these alerts in here. Now, this page will give you an ECAF summary, which will basically show you all the unprocessed ECAFs or the pending ECAFs. And as soon as the student has submitted the application and it's been processed, it will all come in here. You just have to click on process all and it'll process all the application. Once it's been processed, the system automatically puts the access to batch student loan flag to true. So it's gonna tick that flag because when we enroll a student, we left it off because we were unsure whether the student has been approved or not. And if the tax file number is missing, then it'll automatically even update that if it's been provided in ECAF. Now with the pro progressions, so you have to do it, like it basically is done three times in a calendar year. You know, so it's in Feb, June and October. So instead of you manually remembering, you know, who are the students who have to be sent the progression, we've, we've created this page where you just have to come in, 
in Feb, June and October, check the list of students, choose all and just request ESL progression. So ECAF will automatically send out the progressions for them and the student has of course 14 days to complete their progression um, form. If the student doesn't complete it, you really don't have to do anything. But if you want to chase it up, the outstanding progression will show you the list of students who have not completed the uh, progressions for you. All right, that's pretty straightforward. Now, talking about the last bit, so some internal reports. The best thing to do is start typing vet student loan or fee help or just put in like, you know, keywords like a unit of study. So we do have, uh, I, I wanted to show you just one particular report, which is crucial which is the unit and the unit of study enrollment summary. Because sometimes what happens is because you're so used to updating the unit of competencies, you forget to update the unit of study completion statuses. So because it's crucial, we've created this report. It's a matrix report. What it does basically is, I'm just gonna randomly choose students here at the start of this year. So it gives you like, you know, it's an Excel, spreadsheet basically you can even download it as an excel spreadsheet it gives you all the course offer information and everything the um unit enrollment starting and date the outcome the student has got as well as it's going to give you information about the unit of study code the census date and what the student has achieved so you have to remember if the student has got a 20 then that particular unit of study has also been marked as a three which is successfully completed if you see these blanks then obviously there's a data discrepancy. You need to go back and bulk update those results accordingly before you submit your data to HEPCAT, all right? So it's a pretty handy report. You can get it out in an Excel spreadsheet so you can quickly see which of the fields are blank. You can even add filters on the previous page. You can go uh, put in a filter to say, all right, pick up only where the um, outcome code is not blank and completion status is blank. So it actually shows you um, you know, where the outcome has been marked and the completion status has not been marked and things like that. So you can add your own filters to this report. Um, all right, now let's talk about the last bit, which is your exports. So under the reports, you come into exports. But before I go into the details of how you run the export, I want to go back into your HINS help. At the very top, click on VET reporting requirements and 2018 reporting requirements. So you have your VET data collections 2018 reporting schedule here. Print this out, put it on your notice board, put it on, in front of you on your desk because it's very crucial. You can't miss these deadlines, all right? So the first um, file that you send out to them is your VET course of study submission, which is your VCO file. And then comes the VET student submission, which has to be completed by the 7th of every month. And this kind of contains the BEN, VLL and VDU files, which stands for uh, VET Enrollment, VET Loan Liability and VELC, uh, VET Help Due file. So these three files are uh, a combination of the student submission and of course your course completion. The course completion is also completed by the 7th of every month. Just your unit of study completions is a little different because that's done only four times a year on the 7th of April, 7th of July, 7th of October, and 7th of Jan. All right. Uh, if there are any corrections, let's say, you know, the student was an Australian citizen and you've put in a New Zealand citizen there. If there are any corrections like that, then you have to revise your data by the 7th of every month in HEPCAT. We don't handle revisions at the moment in WiseNet, so this is done directly in HEPCAT. All right, now let's go back into WiseNet. So under your VET student loan exports, you need to choose the files accordingly. So the VCO file, which is your course of study file, is only reported once a year, or if you have a new course that you have um, started, you know. If you've enrolled students into a new course and you're submitting the data for the first time, that's when you need to rerun the VCO file. Otherwise, it's just done once a year. Then click Start. It'll automatically run the export for you. With the VL, VEN and VDU files, the best thing about the system is, you know, you can choose records within a census date. Because it's done every month, obviously, it's up to you how many exports you want to run. You know, you can even do 
once every week but it's crucial for you to choose the exact records that you want to run right so you put in the start and end date like let's say the first of um, August until the 31st of August it will pick up the 17th of August due date uh, the census date for you and it'll pick up all the students who fall between that and you can click start if you go all records it's not going to show you the list of students it's just going to go start and give you the files if you go individually select the records then it's going to give you all the student names where you can pick and choose which student you want to report the VCC is your course completion file again that's done every month same thing you can put in like you know start and end dates and the VCU is done four times a year depending on your reporting periods and all our files are ready for import. So as soon as you run it, it gives you the exact format that HEPCAT would take the exports in. So run the export, go into HEPCAT, import the files, and you can start validating. All right, so that's kind of the start to finish of the entire vet student loan process. Um, before I let you go, I'm just gonna take you quickly into our resource center so look for vet student loan resources or ecaf anything that you have a question on just type it in and it'll pick up articles from within the resource center about vet student loans um, and if you have any particular questions to ask feel free to log a ticket so you just have to click on log a support ticket and if you need even like a one-on-one -on -one session like a training we're happy to help you I can see one of your questions where Keith has answered that you know you need to send that manually. He's correct with your under the age of 18 students because there's an exemption there. Uh, but if you want to like you know change the information as I showed you before, you know because it's a manual ECAV and it's still showing you as pending, the best thing to do is go into the enrollment, go edit, and under the ECAV you should be able to change the um, you know status to processed if it's still showing you as pending. But if you're not able to do that, just you know, raise a ticket and I'll check what's happening for you. You should be able to change it to processed. Doug, you're asking me, wasn't sure if you should wait or update the ECAF website. Oh, okay. Uh, look, even if the processing was manual, so in ECAF, if you see that it's been processed, then change the status. But if you, in ECAF, it still shows as pending, so probably the student hasn't completed something on his uh, on from his part. So I think you should wait, you know. So you'll have to change it to processed only if ECAF shows that it's been processed. So just check your ECAF website before you um, update anything in WiseNet. All right, guys, thank you so much for your time. Have a nice day. Bye-bye.